saying that uh, I've been at Berkeley for 16 years and it's an absolute honor to be a part of a community where 100 people are willing to come out on a Saturday morning to learn more about the world around them. You know, it's just, it's fabulous to see you all here today. So if anyone has any questions during the talk, please don't hesitate to raise your hands. It's fun to have a two-way discussion rather than a one-way lecture sometimes. So I'm going to be talking about stem cells within the brain, and just to make sure everybody's on the same page, I just wanted to initially have a couple of bullet points about you know, what is a cell. And cells are, of course, the fundamental unit of life. Uh, they're made up of a number of biochemicals, DNA, you know, the genetic material that encodes information on the inside of the cell, uh, proteins, RNA, lipids, and metabolites. The majority of life on Earth is, is made up of single-cell organisms, bacteria and yeast, for example. But you know, every once in a while, a um, hundred billion of them, a trillion of them will decide to stick together and make up a human being. <laughs> so these cells have a huge number of different functions. You know, not, um, obviously not every single cell in the body is identical. And so we contain a, a number of different types of cells depending upon how finely you slice them, you know, on the order of around 200 or so. So these are neurons, blood cells, muscle cells, skin cells, gut cells, etc. Now I'd like to first or next talk about exactly you know, what gives rise to these different cell types, what's responsible for creating this functional diversity within the adult body. So if we start out with a zygote, a fertilized egg, uh, these divide to create 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and then a ball of 64 cells, which is called a blastocyst stage of an embryo. So when a, a parent or two parents have a hard time having kids, you know they often resort to in vitro fertilization, so the, you can fertilize an egg in vitro within a dish, a piece of plastic, and allow this to grow into roughly this stage of an embryo, and you typically create, you know, on the order of around eight fertilized eggs or so. Several of those are implanted into mom, and the remainder, the leftovers, are frozen down. So the first IVF baby was uh, conceived in 1978, so we've been accumulating these frozen embryos across the United States, across the world, for several decades, for 37 years now. And the United States has around 400,000 of these frozen down in test tubes across the country at fertilization clinics. So some of these parents are now in their 60s and 70s, they're done having kids. So instead of destroying those leftover embryos, discarding them, some of them had decided to, to donate those to science and medicine. So for the very first time in 1998, uh, investigators at the University of Wisconsin uh, took this so-called inner cell mass, a fraction of these cells, put it into a, into a dish and created for the very first time an embryonic stem cell line, or an ES cell, as I'll be calling them for the rest of the talk. These embryonic stem cells have the interesting property of being a so-called pluripotent, which simply means they have the ability to turn into every single cell type in the adult body, the blood cells, the neurons, the skin cells, etc. So the way that they do this is by gradually specializing their function. So you can start out with a pluripotent stem cell, and for example, enable it to specialize into a tissue-specific or organ-specific multipotent stem cell, such as a neural stem cell, which will be the focus of my talk today. And these more specialized multipotent stem cells will then differentiate into the functional cell types that make up our organs and tissues, such as um, glia, you know, oligodendrocytes, as well as uh, neurons in the adult body. So a multipotent stem cell can be derived from embryonic stem cell, but also as adult organisms, you know, if this embryo develops all the way into one of us, we retain pockets or niches of stem cells that are distributed throughout the body. In our bone marrow, we have blood stem cells. In our skin, we have skin stem cells. And as I'll be talking about today in our brains, we actually also have stem cells that continuously create new neurons throughout adult life. But regardless of where these stem cells come from, each one is defined by two properties. The ability to renew, um, to spin around in a circle, divide and make more stem cells. It's a process called self-renewal. And the ability to move from left to right on the slide uh, to specialize or to differentiate into specific cell types. Okay, so why is this so important? You know, it's obviously important for developmental biology, for the ability of individual cells to develop into complex organisms. <clears throat> and we wouldn't be around today if it weren't for stem cells. But it's also important for medicine. So this is a list of um, common ways in which our bodies can lose cells. So if we lose populations of neurons in the adult brain and the cortex in the hippocampus, that's, that's uh, what happens in Alzheimer's disease. If we lose a population of cells in the region of the brain called the substantia nigra, that's what uh, is related to Parkinson's disease. Uh, moving on to type 1 diabetes, you lose the insulin secreting cells in the body. If you lose um, cardiomyocytes, the muscle cells within the heart, that's associated with cardiovascular disease. And these are the huge problems that are facing our healthcare system these days. Um, by the year 2050, they're projected to be 10 million Alzheimer's patients. 
And uh, it's estimated, although that a number of these are actually undiagnosed, there's something on the order of 20 million people in the U.S. that have type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So type 2 falls under that too? There's some types of uh, type 2 diabetes that are dependent upon insulin. Some are, you know, insulin resistance. Type 2 is a really complex set of disorders. But some of them can potentially be treated with a cell replacement therapy. So the idea is that each one of these, or most of them involve situations in which you're losing specific populations of cells within the body. So perhaps we can use a stem cell to replace those lost or damaged cells in the body. So for example, you can isolate or drive a cell, expand it outside the body, for example, in a bioreactor, and then differentiate it or provide it with signals to coax it into differentiating or specializing into a cell type or a collection of cell types that are lost and then implant these back into the body, enable them to engraft, to integrate, and functionally repair tissue. The other approach is, like I mentioned, we all have pockets or niches of stem cells throughout our adult bodies, so maybe we can actually deliver like a small molecule or a protein or a gene to these endogenous stem cells and try to convince them into regenerating the tissues in which they reside to overcome the effects of those diseases. So Kevin and I coordinated um, our talk, so he's really going to be discussing this branch of potential therapies, uh, and we work on both within my lab, and today I'm going to be talking to you about this approach. And both of them have significant promise for being able to regenerate tissues within the body. So several of these diseases, you'll notice, involve the central nervous system, so Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, for example, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Huntington's disease. Our lab is really focused on central nervous system therapy. And I want to talk about stem cells within the brain, within the central nervous system for the rest of today. So if you take a look at a developing brain, this is a human brain at different snapshots of time, all the way from conception through birth. And uh, the brain obviously grows really fast in size. And the cells that are responsible for this growth are the stem cells. They're the ones that are very, very rapidly dividing and continuously creating new neurons within this developing tissue. And at the peak, within the central nervous system, Babies create something on the order of 200 million neurons within their brains every single minute. However, it was believed that once this organism, once babies are, are done developing, or um, adolescence, typically around the age of 15 or so, um, it was believed throughout the majority of the past century that we lose the ability to add new neurons, that the adult brain doesn't have stem cells. And that idea really originated with uh, this fellow, Simone Ramoni Cajal, who won a Nobel Prize in the early 1900s and is really you know, credited with being the father or the grandfather of the field of neuroscience. So what he did was to take a number of brain slices, and this is a single neuron right there, he stained them and essentially mapped out the circuitry, the wiring that connects different regions in the brain. So he was the first person to really understand all the connectivity within the brain and how that could potentially lead to brain function. Throughout staring at thousands and thousands of these tissue sections, though, he never saw a situation in which there was a mature neuron that was in the process of dividing to create two new neurons. So based upon this, he really concluded or really began to develop this dogma that the adult brain lacks the ability to add new neurons at all. So there's a rather famous quote which says that once development is ended, the fonts of growth and regeneration, the axons and the dendrites, this wiring, dry up irrevocably. And adult centers, nerve paths, or something fixed, ended and immutable. Everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. And ironically, it's for the science of the future, if possible, to change this harsh degree. So this dogma began to get chipped away at um, in the 1980s from, of all places, songbirds. Where so, yes? I didn't hear. Where songbirds? Songbirds. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the brain of a, of a songbird that's often a model system that people utilize to study the way in which organisms learn new, new experiences, new memories. And uh, they found within a couple of regions within this brain that there's actually cycling, oscillations in the number of newborn cells that appeared to be neurons. They had a way of labeling these cells, and they found out, this is uh, June, July, August, September, and October, there was a peak in the number of newborn cells within the brain. And this went down, and then it peaked again in March. And then they analyzed behavior within these animals, and they found that their syllables, the, the complexity of the songs that they sing, peaked right around the same time they were adding new cells to the brain. And it turns out this is responsible for mating behavior. If you're a male songbird, you have to have a complex song in order to attract a mate. And biology provided this interesting mechanism, the birth of newborn cells, newborn neurons within the brain, as a way to learn this complex song. 
So these publications began to come out, and they gathered a lot of attention, but people said, okay, that's birds, no way it happens to human beings. And the dogma got chipped away at for another decade or so, to the point where in the mid to late 1900, or 1990s, investigators began to develop definitive evidence to prove that the adult human brain, one, has stem cells, and two, adds new neurons on a daily basis. So this specifically occurs not throughout the entire brain, it only occurs in a couple of locations. So at least uh, lower mammals, such as rodents, have this population of stem cells in this region right here called the SVZ, and these new neurons that come from these stem cells migrate to a region of the brain called the olfactory bulb, which is really important for developing new memories associated with smell. So if you ablate this population of cells, for example, moms, mother mice lose the ability to recognize their pups because they use the smell for that recognition. However, the population of cells that's really fascinated my lab over the past uh, couple of decades has been a second region within the, uh, within the adult brain that's known as the hippocampus. It's a center for learning and memory. So if you zoom within this region, this little V-shaped structure right here, uh, shown here is that same V, and the green cells are mature neurons, the red cells are an important supporting population of cells called astrocytes, and shown here in blue are labeled stem cells. So these stem cells will continuously divide in your brains on a daily basis and create on the order of around 1,000 new neurons uh, in your brains every single day. So you can isolate these cells just to characterize them and grow them on a dish as uh, immature stem cells, or as you begin to add factors, different chemicals to the growth culture medium, the nutrients, you can begin to convince these cells to differentiate. So shown here in red is that supporting population of cells, those astrocytes, in green are oligodendrocytes. These are myelinating cells within the nervous system. So for example, if a neuron is the copper wire in the middle of this cord, the oligodendrocytes are the insulation that wrap themselves around that wire and enhance the conductivity of the neurons. So patients who lose those oligodendrocytes, which is exactly what happens in multiple sclerosis, lose the ability to conduct electricity in the brain. And finally, those stem cells can turn into newborn neurons. Yes? So maybe I'm confused about this. My old you know, biology, I, I always heard that was a myelin sheath. Mm -hmm. thought about that? Yeah, that's, exactly. That's the same thing? It, exact same thing. So these, uh, these uh, oligodendrocyte cells form these really complex layered structures that essentially wrap themselves around, uh, around the neurons. So you can kind of view it as taking a pencil and rolling it up in a pancake. That's almost what it looks like. Yes? Is there a fixed number of stem cells, or are new ones being generated all the time? There are new ones being generated all the time. I'll talk in a minute about um, how the fact it's not fixed and hardwired. It's actually um, changed or modulated by behavioral decisions that we make on a daily basis. So these cells integrate into the brain, and it was uh, proven, uh, this is the person, Fred Gage, who actually originally discovered stem cells in the hippocampus. He's down in San Diego, I trained in his lab. And uh, this investigator, uh, Henriette von Prague, first found that these cells integrate into the brain, extend their wiring, and become electrophysiologically active, electrically active, so they begin to conduct electricity and communicate with their neighbors. Um, in addition, over the past several years, it's really, uh, this is work in progress, this, these are publications that have happened over the past couple of years, that really try to investigate what is it about the function of the hippocampus that requires newborn neurons in order to, to carry out its tasks. And if you ablate the newborn neurons, all of a sudden the brain begins to suffer in its capacity to carry out these tasks. So one is a pattern separation, just to, to give you an idea of what that is. Um, a pattern separation is your ability to distinguish between multiple copies of memories that are almost identical. So the analogy I use is that, you know, for example, if I park at Berkeley at Upper Hearst Lot, I park in the exact same spot every day because I have lousy <laughs> pattern separation and I wouldn't remember where my car was if I parked in a different place every day. So pattern separation is the ability to remember and distinguish between many different uh, but similar copies of the same experience. Complex spatial memory, uh, for example, is the ability to drive in San Francisco to navigate. <laughs> um, so neurogenesis, like uh, your question prompted, is, is not something that is fixed and hardwired. It's not like you generate a thousand new neurons every single day the rest of your life. It's actually modulated by experiences and by decisions that we make. And I want to give you an example of that. So for, uh, as one example, mice uh, typically live in a really boring cage. They have some wood shavings, they have plastic, you know, four walls, and they have um, some, some uh, uh, food and water to drink. 
Um, however, it's been known for a number of years that if you place an animal within a so-called enriched environment, where they have little tunnels to run around, they have a running wheel, they have uh, balls to nudge around, these animals perform better in learning and memory tasks. They're quote unquote smarter. And there's also evidence to indicate that the same thing happens uh, in some cases with human beings. Humans that are within a, a really mundane, monogenic, or a monodispersed environment, sorry, monochromatic environment, really um, boring environment, as opposed to human beings who reach out, reach out and in, engage with the world around them. Uh, so the latter population that actually has better learning and memory behavior. <coughs> so these investigators ask the question, okay, does this effective environment on brain function have anything to do with stem cells in the brain? and the ability to add neurons. So this is, um, I'm switching colors on you here, but this is that same V-shaped structure. Every single one of these black circles is a newborn neuron. And they found that um, on day one, when they exposed these animals to the enriched environment, they, they have about the same number of neurons that are born. But if you track those neurons, four weeks later, there are twice as many of them that have survived and stuck around in the long term and integrated into the brain for animals in this enriched environment compared to that boring environment. So the investigators then began to dissect that environmental enrichment and try to figure out what exactly is it about you know, this image that's responsible for this increase in the number of newborn neurons. And uh, they found they put animals into an environment where they have the ability to learn. Uh, they put animals in an environment where they were forced to exercise. Uh, they put them into a pool and so they had to swim or sink or swim, literally. They gave animals the ability to voluntarily exercise by putting a running wheel within the cage and um, as well as a couple of other conditions. And they found that voluntary running was what was responsible for this effective environmental enrichment on increase in neurons within the brain. So if the animals were forced to exercise, it had no benefit, but if the animals were offered the ability to exercise, it actually doubled the number of newborn neurons. So Henriette von Krog, when she made this discovery, quite literally went out and bought a pair of Nikes and started jogging. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes? Do you think the type of exercise they had an effect on the brain versus running? Uh, yes, so um, it's not necessarily a type of exercise. This is a hypothesis, it's not proven. But um, I'll talk about it in a second. This is, the, this is the good stuff, the stuff that increases neurogenesis. There's some conditions that decrease it, and one of those is stress. So if you force an animal to exercise by putting them into a pool and say sink or swim, it can likely cancel out the beneficial effects of exercise. So you gotta want to exercise. Uh, yes? Why would you think that the enriched environment doesn't do much benefit for the rodents? Um, uh, so this is the number of newborn cells and this is the number that sticks around after four weeks. So environmental enrichment both increases the number of newborn cells and that, sorry, enrich, uh, uh, it does not increase the number of newborn cells but it does increase the uh, number that are retained, or the number of this initial boost that survive after four weeks. Running appears to do both, or exercise appears to do both. But if you compare these two, you know, they're almost identical after four weeks uh, compared to the animals that were in the boring environment. So does that mean if I have an enriched environment that I don't want to exercise, I'm okay? <laughs> <laughs> So they next uh, began to, to test how quote-unquote smart these animals were. And you've heard the old cliche of a mouse in a maze. That's literally what these data are. So they uh, counted how long it took for these animals to find their, to kind of navigate their way through what's called a Morris water maze. And the control animals are right here. Every single day they're trained on this maze. Uh, it takes them less and less time to make it through. So that, that's learning in action. But the animals that have the ability to exercise learn faster. So there's a correlation between um, experience, exercise, or environmental enrichment, the birth of new neurons in the brain, and how quote-unquote smart um, a mouse is, at least. So that's the, the good news. Uh, the not as good news is there are a number of adverse um, effects that can actually decrease neurogenesis. So one of these is stress. Um, another one is actually um, lack of sleep. So these are the two things that undergrads at Berkeley do when they're cramming for an exam, right? Um, another one is aging, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And furthermore, there is at least evidence, although it's mixed, that neurodegenerative disease can actually decrease the function of stem cells within the adult brain. So uh, obviously, aging and neurodegenerative disease are conditions that are associated with a loss of function of the adult brain. So the idea is, can we learn enough about these cells in order to stimulate their function to increase the rate of generation of new neurons, um, and as a result, potentially overcome some of the adverse effects associated with aging or disease. 
So we've been doing work on aging over the past uh, few years, and it was originally discovered uh, over, uh, actually almost two decades ago, that um, age is one of the most significant conditions that leads to a decrease of neurogenesis, or the generation of new neurons within the adult brain. So this is, uh, the, the phenomenon was originally published in 96. These are some data from my lab that just reproduced the, the phenomenon. So uh, shown in green and red are these uh, stem cells, and this is in a young mouse uh, on the order of a couple of months old, and this is an old mouse that's on the order of two years old. So you can see that both the number of cells uh, in, within this region of the brain and also actually the number that are actively dividing decreases substantially. So the question is, you know, is this um, a problem with the cell? Does the cell actually become broken? Um, in which case it might be kind of irreversible, difficult to correct that problem. Or perhaps it's a, a consequence of the environment around that cell, because the environment is continuously sending biochemical signals to that cell to tell it when to divide, when to differentiate, when to stay quiescent and do nothing. So the question is, can you actually um, learn enough about those environmental signals potentially to reverse that problem? So evidence for that idea came out of the lab of uh, an investigator at Berkeley by the name of Marina Convoy, who we've been collaborating with. And she did what's called a heterochronic parabiosis. This is work she did in a post, as a postdoctoral fellow. And uh, the idea is you connect up the, uh, the circulatory system, the blood system, between two organisms. And you can do that in a way where you connect or wire up a young mouse to, a, to another young mouse, old mouse to an old mouse. And you can connect uh, the blood system, this is just a cartoon version of it, uh, between a young mouse and an old mouse. And the idea is that if this is uh, a, a problem with the environmental signals, the biochemistry around the cell, then perhaps by taking the signals from this young mouse and placing it within the aged animal, you can reverse the effect, you can rescue the stem cells. So that's a hypothesis. And she was studying muscle. And it turns out that uh, across the body, not just in the brain, the function of stem cells begins to decline with aging. And she found that um, within aged animals, this is what happens if uh, an animal ages, the ability of its muscle to regenerate decreases. But if you actually connect it to, a, to a, the circulation of a young animal, it completely rescues the function of that muscle, the stem cells within the muscle. So all of a sudden, this old animal is behaving like a young animal. Okay. So can we begin to harness that idea within the adult brain and perhaps identify signals that become misregulated with age in the adult brain? Yes? Are those mice clones, or they, do they have to be genetically identical? <clears throat> they don't have to be genetically identical. Um, for this experiment, though, they are, they are genetically identical. So uh, in a collaboration with Arena, we discovered several signals, uh, what are called BMP signals, that unfortunately go up a lot with aging. So BMP2, BMP4, BMP6. And yes? Oh, yes, please. Was there any impact on the young mouse and the effect of the circulatory system? No, it appeared that the young mouse's signals actually overrode the, uh, the aged mouse, and, um, but the effect is not, not the other way around. Uh, so these are three molecules that go up with aging. And the idea is perhaps, you know, this is not the fault of the stem cell. Maybe if we can actually correct or rejuvenate the signaling environment around the stem cell, we can begin to reverse some of this decrease in neurogenesis with age. Uh, so we used a, just a technique called uh, RNA interference. I'm not going to go into details. But by uh, knocking out the signaling pathway, which apparently goes up with age, we're able to kind of jumpstart or increase the number of newborn cells within the adult brain. And the last piece of data I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to hand over uh, the floor to Kevin, is uh, another signaling pathway. Uh, this is called uh, TGF-beta. And we again find that the signaling pathway becomes apparently upregulated within the aged brain. So we did this just using a variety of different measurements, but whichever way we cut it, whichever way we measure it, there's an increase in the activity of this pathway within the adult brain. And it turns out that this signal, as well as the BMPs, tell the stem cell to become quiescent, to go to sleep. And if you upregulate the signal, it basically shuts down the stem cell. So fortunately, there are actually small molecules uh, that inhibit this TGF-beta signaling pathway. And these were originally developed as cancer drugs. They've been in people. It turns out they weren't effective for cancer. But we can recycle them or utilize them for this purpose. So what we began to do was to feed these, um, these aged animals. These are mice that are about two years old. Uh, began to feed them this small molecule that was originally developed as a cancer drug. 
And we find that um, if we begin to inhibit the signaling pathway that again becomes apparently activated with age and tells the stem cells to go to sleep, we can actually um, more than double the number of newborn neurons within, this, within the adult brain. And as a bonus, it turns out that the same signaling pathway becomes elevated and represses stem cell function, not just in the brain, but within other tissues or other stem cell niches in the body. So for example, in muscle, as I described to you earlier, Rena discovered that um, with aging, muscle stem cells become inhibited and you lose the ability to regenerate muscle. TGF-beta is also responsible for that. So within the same animals, we're able to hit two birds with one stone. By knocking down the signaling pathway, we both increase the number of newborn neurons in the brain as well as enhance muscle regeneration. So uh, that's a couple of snapshots into work that's going on uh, within our lab and within Berkeley in general. But I just want to leave you, yes? So are there negative impacts of, of reducing that signal? If you reduce it too far, you can actually begin to inhibit important functions within the body. Uh, so it appears that uh, it's almost a bell curve. You have to hit the optimal dose. So you just have to be careful on dosage, but uh, provided that you do that, uh, the, the effects are, are really mild. It's a relatively safe treatment. It's been in humans before, but for cancer, not for brains. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, uh, two quick questions. One, what's the modality that you're um, infusing a small molecule into the animal? Mm -hmm. Are they ingesting something, or are you giving them an injection? Um, it's in their drinking water. Okay. <laughs> and, and the, uh, my other question is, uh, uh, diabetes type 1 is often considered to be an uh, autoimmune yes. disease in which the body attacks uh, the pancreas. Mm -hmm. uh, so if that's true and you find a way to uh, rejuvenate a, a, an inactive pancreas, what is to prevent the body from knocking that down again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Uh, same thing goes for multiple sclerosis, which is an mm -hmm. autoimmune disease where uh, the body's immune system begins to attack the oligodendrocytes. Uh, there, is a, a, there are a number of ideas um, to try to modulate immune function to overcome autoimmunity. Um, in the case of type 1 diabetes, you know, it's often that by the time you've discovered it, the, the, type, the beta cells are gone. Uh, so if you could replace those beta cells and then, and then modulate immune function, um, either suppress the immune system or induce what's called immunological tolerance of the implanted cells, you could potentially replace them and try to ensure that they stay around as well. And would you replace them also with stem cell that would cause the patient to, to have his, his own pancreatic tissue? Um, that's a possibility. So Kevin might be touching upon that. Uh, there are a number of uh, <laughs> several clinical trials in California to generate beta cells to implant into the body. And you can either do that autologously, where you use your own cells and maybe reboot them into a stem cell and then differentiate them into beta cells. That's, um, that's challenging to do for a number of reasons. The other possibility is to use just a general human embryonic stem cell line, make the beta cells, and, and then perhaps ensheath them in some protection or uh, suppress the immune system so that the cells are not rejected after implantation. Yes? I was assuming a lot of people would buy this from Amazon. <laughs> um, the, that's, a, that's a great question. We certainly are not recommending self-medication, but uh, it's, uh, I mean, the, the small molecule is, is something called an ALK5 inhibitor. ALK5 is the receptor for this signaling molecule, uh, the receptor on the cell surface that binds to this TGF-beta and kind of communicates that, that signal to the inside of the stem cell. So it's, uh, it's what's called an ALK5 inhibitor, and there, there are a number of those. And do you have a theory why the signaling for the stem cells to keep regenerating is not found as we get older? Is it linked to some other function that our body can't do anymore? And so, it... mm -hmm. it's, um, so it's related to inflammation. There's a lot of evidence that as um, organisms age, their tissues become more inflammatory, and it's almost like they enter into a kind of a chronic low-level inflammation. Uh, TGF-beta is involved in immunomodulation, and so we think it's going up at the same time as others of these inflammatory signals. Uh, yes? Uh, about the boring environment and the enriched environment, so the animal is physically and mentally interacting with an enriched environment. Mm -hmm. Is there any information about Pairing the human interacting with an enriched electronic environment. Oh, that's a really cool question. Without the kinesthetic uh -huh. factor, but still, 
potentially highly enriched? Yeah, there is, so there's some evidence, um, this is all really kind of new stuff, and as a result, there's some differences in what the literature says yet. You know, the field hasn't arrived at a final verdict. There's some studies that say that just learning stimulates neurogenesis in the adult brain. And, you know, that kind of makes sense from a, from a um, evolutionary and a biological viewpoint, that if you have new experiences that you have to internalize and process and remember, maybe you need new neurons as a mechanism to do that. There are other studies that say that learning is not neurogenic or pro-neurogenic. Um, and there are some differences in the design of those two studies, you know, in the case of the, the second case where it's not neurogenic, um, those animals actually also had some stress involved in that, in that study, which again, like I mentioned earlier, could counteract the beneficial effects on neurogenesis. Uh, so uh, I don't think anybody's done any kind of investigation yet on whether or not learning can be um, conceptual without physical activity, but that's, that's a terrific question, unanswered. Yes? How do you measure uh, whether or not a brain is losing neurons or gaining neurons? Uh, so within human beings, this has been done. I'll take just 30 seconds because it's a fascinating experience, uh, a quite, uh, fascinating story. And part of this work was done actually at Lawrence Livermore Lab. Uh, so the way that, uh, one way in which you can investigate that is by um, within uh, post-mortem human tissue, you can isolate the tissue and count the number of cells. And the way that you can tell whether or not those are newborn cells is by taking a look at the content in the DNA. So what happened in the 1950s and 60s is that the US and the USSR blew up a bunch of bombs, right? And that led to a bunch of radioactive carbon being introduced into the atmosphere. Every single time a cell divides, it needs to duplicate its genome. So, you know, people who are born in the 50s and 60s breathed in a very tiny amount, like tracer amounts, of the radioactive carbon, which got taken up into those cells. So once they die, you can actually go into the brain and quantify how many cells have radioactive carbon, indicating that cells underwent division. And you can basically quantify the rate of, of birth of new cells within the adult brain. So it's you know fascinating um, study. And they, as a result of doing that, were able to show that human beings actually have reduced neurogenesis with aging. Does that mean there's not a way of measuring without without it being close border? Uh, not currently. There's not a way to do it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Going back to uh, mice running, was there any way of measuring how much exercise? Yeah. Um, so the same idea, like when you, if you have a bike and you have that, you know, those little magnets that run around, and every single time they hit a sensor, it, it advances the uh, the odometer by what three feet or so. Did the same thing with the running wheels. These 25 gram mice uh, ran two and a half miles a day each. Yeah. <laughs> and so if we scale that up to a human being that's you know 50 kilograms in size, <laughs> we'd probably be running a marathon a day. But, <laughs> but uh, I don't think you know. It's just uh, these mice are very, very hardy, and it's probably just the, the experience of being very physically active, regardless of how many miles it happens to be, uh, that would be beneficial. And that's obviously not unique to the brain. There's so many studies indicating that exercise is good for the heart, for muscle, for cognition, for many, many different aspects of you know, human physiology. Okay, so just a, a couple of uh, bullet points for people to take home. Uh, adult brains create new neurons throughout your lives, every single day. <laughs> It's not throughout the entire brain, it's only within a couple of specific locations, which is why Simona Ramoni Gahar likely missed it. And uh, specifically, we're really interested in the population of cells in the hippocampus, which is this really important center for human learning and memory. Uh, this neurogenesis is not hardwired, it's actually regulated by many of the decisions and choices that we make on a daily basis. And uh, we'd like to really understand how to tap into that potential within the brain, the existence of these cells in the brain, in order to coax them and convince them to regenerate tissue. And uh, we've, I haven't talked about a lot of this work, we've made actually a lot of progress in identifying the biochemical signals around cells that both enhance or stimulate neurogenesis as well as repress it. And uh, each one of those molecules then becomes a drug target for us that we can potentially modulate or change in order to make that environment conducive or stimulating of new, new neuronal growth. And I showed you some, some ways in which we're directly harnessing that to overcome one condition in which neurogenesis decreases, which is aging. So uh, thanks so much uh, for your time and attention. I'd be happy to address any more questions.